Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to our second session on the Course of Holiness. Uh, in the first session we covered chapters 1 to 3 on repentance, recovery and restoration. We looked at uh, the three chapters which basically spoke about uh, the importance of repentance. Uh, without repentance or lack of repentance uh, keeps us from believing. Uh, we saw that lack of repentance keeps us from receiving. Uh, from Matthew 4 17 and we also saw that in the New Testament the message begins with the call of call to repentance for sinners but at the end of the New Testament it concludes with the call to repentance for the churches as well and so we, we can conclude very safely um, that repentance or the message of repentance and repentance in itself is for the unbelievers and for believers uh, to continue living a righteous life. And then we uh, saw what it literally means, the word repentance, metanoia in Greek means to think differently. It's a verb that means uh, we also act on how we think. Uh, and, um, and God is welcoming and he's forgiving, he's abounding in, um, in love for those who repent and come back to him and who return uh, to him. In chapter 3, we saw that there is no negotiating with sin. Um, right? It says to pluck it and to cast it out. And when things are hard, God is willing uh, to help us uh, for his good pleasure that we might live a holy life, a life according to uh, the word of God. So that is what was covered in the first session, the three chapters. Uh, we will continue uh, with chapter four, which will be in the part two of the PDF document that was shared with you. Um, yeah, Ravali, you have a question? I, I have a question. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, this repentance, um, so sometimes uh, when we repent, is it always needs to be that you feel convicted, um, you know, uh, in the sense of some, I mean, sometimes you repent, but you don't really uh, feel anything about it. But you know, you have to repent. That is the way that you go back to God and maybe you say a sorry to God, but you don't really feel. So uh, how does it exactly happen? needs to be what is repentant a repentance in the sense uh do it does only shown with actions or even when you are having a word conversation with god is that something that you really um uh, feel convicted and like do it or not just for the sake of it yeah see when uh when we first become a believer right when we uh, say the salvation prayer whenever we give our lives to jesus we receive um it says by faith we receive salvation right romans we see that in ephesians chapter 2 we see that it's, it's a gift right uh, we don't necessarily feel anything and so uh, it's we receive the gift of grace by faith and even here when uh, when we repent uh, we're receiving forgiveness um, by faith we're not i'm not expecting to feel anything but uh now I believe that I have forgiven because the word of God says so, right? Um, if you repent, he forgives, he's abounding. And now I need to express that in the way that I live. Thanks, Vishnu. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a follow-up question to that? Uh, no, I don't have a follow-up question. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, so as, as we, if we can continue with uh, chapter four, and that's partly what we will also be discussing in this chapter uh, with regards to what Ravali just asked. Um, chapter four is titled Repentance, Grace, and Forgiveness. And so uh, also Ravali, I hope that uh, this, there's more added to my answer and, and there's something that you can take away more from this chapter. Okay, and so uh, do believers need to repent? Um, do we need to repent? Oh, do you believe that? Do believers believe that? Hmm. 
right? Does the blood of Jesus automatically cover sin? Is forgiveness for for sin automatic? Uh, does living in grace imply that a believer is al already forgiven uh, because we are in the new covenant and because we are under grace? I can do whatever I want to do uh, because God is all loving. He is good. He is a father. Uh, you know, so my father understands, um, so I don't need to repent because he's a good, 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 good father. You can add some 10 goods to it, right? Um, but that's what we'll probably look uh, at a little bit more in this chapter. So, uh, repentance, righteousness, and transformation. Repentance, righteousness, and transformation. Um, you know, in I think in um, I think in the next semester, in your final year, you will have a course on Romans, on the Book of Romans. Um, it's, it's a wonderful course. Um, you know, I would encourage if you're not continuing your final year, at least to do that course. It's wonderful. But anyways, we see from the Book of Romans, from chapter five to chapter twelve, uh, uh, you know, it gives a very clear pathway for a believer. And actually, it, this path, the foundations to this pathway it starts in Romans chapter three, where Paul is uh, is such an amazing apologist, or uh, he start, begins to build this case. You know, uh, he's building this case, he's building his argument, and Romans chapter twelve is like that release. You know, he unleashes um, this whole thing. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna. Um, Right. And so in Romans chapter 5, uh, we see uh, the wonderful truth um, is that we are justified, uh, you know, by faith. Um, in in fact, in the last verse of Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4 verse 25, it says that, uh, you know, after we were justified, he was, Jesus was risen from the dead. Um, and then that message continues um, in Romans chapter 5, is that we are justified, we are set free. Um, right, it is an important topic uh, um, to study about justification itself, um, and uh, so I would encourage you to do that. Uh, what is justification? Uh, why is it important? Uh, how are we justified? Um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So in Romans chapter five, we see that we are set free. We are justified. Uh, it simply means that uh, our legal status in God is changed. Our legal status in God was changed. Uh, Romans 3.23, Paul says that uh, all have sinned and fallen short of his glory. Right, And in Romans 6, we see that he, 6.23 again, he says that um, the wages of sin is death. Um, so building the case, we see now, you know, we were all legally in the, in the eyes of God. Uh, we were in a state of sin, condemned to death. But now that we are justified because of what Jesus did on the cross, uh, I am no longer in the state of sin, right? I am legally, my position is changed before him. I am now declared not guilty, right? Um, but however, because I, although I'm saved uh, from uh, the state of sin, and because I c continue to exist in this body, um, I do have the capacity to commit acts of sin. That's where Romans 6, uh, you know, emphatically states that we cannot continue in sin um, just because of abounding grace. And we cannot continue in sin. Um, and it talks about the power of sin uh, over our lives, the sin can have over our lives, uh, but which has been broken on the cross of Jesus Christ. So Romans 5, he says that we are justified. Romans 6, we say that we cannot continue to live in sin and the power of sin uh, has been broken on uh, on the cross by Jesus. And then Romans chapter 7, it teaches that uh, the unregenerate man cannot keep the law of God by his own power. Like in his flesh, uh, we cannot try, to, in our own strength, we cannot try to keep the word of God. The law of God, uh, because uh, sin that dominates the flesh, and Romans eight teaches us that we must walk in the spirit to put an end to the sinful deeds of the flesh. And then finally, in Romans twelve, we see that we must be transformed in the way we live, not be conformed to the world, but be transformed right, by the renewing of our 
mind. Okay, um, so because so from Romans chapter three, or actually from Romans chapter one, all the way to Romans twelve uh, to eleven, actually. Paul, in very different ways, uh, he's talking about the mercies of God. That's what he's talking from Romans chapter 1 to Romans 11. He's just talking about the mercy of God in by sharing all of these things. And that's why Romans 12, he starts off by saying, therefore. Right? So, therefore, Romans 1 to 11, he goes on to say, offer yourselves as living sacrifice. Um, so we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, as it says in Romans 12, verse 2. Right? Um, and that's the call for every believer. A believer's transformation into Christ-likeness means that there is a continual change in thinking. A continual change in um, thinking. Right? When we talk about sanctification, sanctification has two parts to it, which is... Uh, the positional sanctification and the progressive sanctification. Now, a lot, now justification and sanctification, sanctification, positional sanctification goes hand in hand. And when we talk about progressive sanctification, uh, is what uh, the life of uh, a transformed life of a believer looks like. Right? Uh, it is an important part of uh, every believer's um, life that we that we continue to. Uh, you know, thrive and work towards looking um, like Jesus, being Christ-like in, in the way we think and in the way we, we act and do lives. Okay. Uh, in, in, in the New Testament, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, and, 11 to 14, I just want to quickly check. Um, my, com my, my computer is saying that my internet is unstable. I just want to make sure that uh, if you're all able to hear me well, if there's any disconnect, please let me know. We are able to hear you well. Okay, all right. Thank you. Um, so, thanks, Chira. Thank you, lovely. Okay, so, uh, you know, we are encouraged in scriptures to not live in our sinful ways. Uh, and we saw that extensively in the last section, is that we cannot live like the old man. We are a new creation. So therefore, everything has to change. We can't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Right? And in Titus 2, verse 11 to 14, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Okay, so there's the grace of God that brings salvation. And what does this grace of God do? In verse 12, we see that teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Right? We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age by denying all ungodliness and worldly lust. This is what the grace of God teaches. It emphasizes. And so if there is a message uh, out there about the grace of God uh, that says, okay, because of the grace of God, we now have the license to do whatever we want to do, um, it, to live in a sinful way that we, you know, um, that is not talking about um, the biblical grace of God, something else. And so uh, when we allow the grace of God to teach us and when we learn from it, in verse 14 he says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. Okay, We are called to practice right living, righteous living. We are called to live a life of holiness. They're forsaking you know, and denying all ungodliness. And then we see that fellowship, repentance, and forgiveness, they are interconnected or interrelated. Right? Fellowship, repentance, and forgiveness. So John in his epistles, uh, you know, he writes, saying that if we have fellowship with him and continue to walk in darkness, 
if we, or if we claim and if we say that we have fellowship with him, if you say that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that you are a Christian, that you are born again, and continue to walk in sin, in darkness, what is happening is that we are lying, and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If you're saying the truth, and if we, if we live according to the Word of God, according to His command, if we live a righteous and holy life, we have fellowship with one another, what is Him and us. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Right? So we say, I'm born again, um, have this fellowship with Him, and if he is the wine and we are the branches, and if we are in him and he is in us, um, the result is that we are being cleansed from all our sins and we've made made whole and righteous. And verse 8 he says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Right? Something like the world says nowadays, isn't it? Um, um, how am I sinful? What is sin? Uh, why am I a sinner? I didn't do anything wrong for me to be a sinner. I do good things. I care for the poor. I, I do all the right things. How am I a sinner? If we say that we do not sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And verse 9 it says, if we confess our sins, if we confess, if we repent, if we are willing to repent, He is faithful. If we return to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, you know, these are, I am aware that these are all familiar passages that uh, as Christians uh, you would have heard these verses so many times in, in messages, in teachings, you know, etc. But I pray that we don't lose the wonder of these verses um, as we go through them over and over. Right? So we can't say we have fellowship with Him and continue to walk in sinful ways or live in habitual sin or in a, a sinful lifestyle. Um, but instead, if we repent, uh, He's faithful and just to forgive. Right? Um, and again, sins are forgiven because of the price Jesus paid on the cross. Um, and so uh, when we repent and confess, um, you know, just again, in a way, is still answering to Ravali's questions, is that how do we know that we are forgiven? The sins are forgiven because the price Jesus paid on the cross. Right? He paid the price on the cross. And so um, we do not practice unrighteousness as believers. We do not... Uh, we are not encouraged to live in continual sin. We do not hold a bitterness or hate or anger or unforgiveness in our hearts. Um, we do not lie. Uh, we do not give room for pride in our hearts. Right? And um, but so if we do sin and we do not say that we have not sinned, uh, we do not say we have no sin. Okay. Uh, if we do sin, we do not say we have not sinned. We confess. Uh, you know, uh, we we we. Uh, you know, I have committed this, um, and if we go back to him and we ask for uh, forgiveness. Uh, yes, Ravali, I see your hands raised. Uh, uh, sorry, if I'm not interrupting. Uh, so, on based of uh, based on what uh, what I've heard right now. I have a question. So, uh, if somebody is in a continual sin, mm -hmm. for example, a person who is in ministry and they are uh, they are in a continual sin, uh, even though they may might be repenting every day, uh, but still they are not able to get back to their uh, original state or whatever. So, how does it work? Uh, because I always heard that giftings and calling is not is irrevocable. Sorry. Giftings and callings are irrevocable. Okay. Uh, so the people who are in ministry are they are only serving God and yeah. they are in a continual sin. Yeah. Uh, so 
and they are not able to repent maybe turn their ways around mm-hmm. uh, right. so how does it work not having a relationship with god or, or i mean i'm definitely assuming that there is a gap between them and god because of this sin yeah yeah so but there are still in ministry there are uh, doing things in the name of god or for god yes. so how does that work um not having a relationship with god yes or, or they just uh, running on the gifting that has been given to them because uh, if they are in continual sin at that some point god will not allow them to do what they are doing right right uh, so how does it the dynamics work so do we say there is a okay um the, i know there is no time limit or there is no frame that okay still uh, still you know till this point of time it will work right. but um, how do they really work i'm i've wanted to know your thoughts on it yeah so i'll share my thoughts because i do not have a definite answer um because it's it's mysterious in the way that god works right uh, for example i'm not going to take the place of god and say uh you know this is how many times god will forgive and that is that will be like me insulting the price that jesus paid for us on the cross right um so i'm not going to take the place however what i will say is for example if you take a life of saul king saul um right he was god's chosen uh, the first king of israel right he was anointed to be the king um but everything what he did uh was uh by his own choice even till the point of him taking his own life uh, was his own choice but there was always opportunity for him to repent and change his ways and that is why david is such a big contrast uh, and so that's a perfect example of you know two men of god who were chosen by god anointed by god um you know who who realized that they committed sin but one was just too arrogant uh, to uh, ask for forgiveness but the other was broken in repentance and so um and i and i believe that you know a person's life will uh, the way god honors a repentance uh will be so different in a person's life and we see that in the life of david what happens after he repents it's 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 never the same after he repents uh and so uh with ministers who are uh, in ministry uh you know we don't know their secret life um you know i might be your teacher right now and you don't really know what i'm thinking i might be talking about holiness but my mind could be something else uh, you know i might do something else after the class there's no telling isn't it but god sees everything and um, and so the opportunity remains the same that uh, like we read in isaiah 55 seek the lord while he is still available right and so when we seek him uh, when we go back to him repent and say you know when as we read as we read from the scripture that he is willing um you know to do for his good pleasure that okay you know i did something wrong i'm going back to him ask for forgiveness um and i believe that i have been forgiven and um you know allow the holy spirit to help me live a, a holy life but if i continue to live in the arrogance saying that okay you no know, i can do whatever i want to do and then later i go forgive i'll sit on the fence you know it's like uh, christians say uh i'll sit on the fence when i when the end is really near i will jump on to the other side <laughs> um so I, uh, what my observation roughly uh, what i would say is that it's the posture of your heart is uh, a person may truly be struggling to overcome a certain sin uh, it could be a pastor or a teacher or a, whoever uh, a believer right uh, they are willing right um they are addicted to drugs they know it is wrong uh, but they don't have uh, they 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 just not able to uh, overcome and that's when um it is always advisable um for anybody in believer pastor more so with the leaders i would say is to reach out for professional help is or reach out to your friends for help uh, or to your other leaders elders for help and say i am struggling with this and i think that's the huge problem that we uh, that 
this Christian ecosystem, if I may say, is created is that uh, we have not given enough liberty for believers to say, I'm st I, to just accept that I'm. this is my weakness, I need help. Because somehow it's been portrayed as weakness, you know, um, the, oh, he's pastor's daughter, he's going for counseling. Uh, you know, she's going for counseling. Uh, you know, how insulting is that? And sometimes pastors even stop their children from receiving professional help because of the fear of what the congregation or people might speak about. And I think uh, so in situations like that, there are individuals who are genuinely struggling to overcome uh, and they keep forgiving. Uh, they keep asking, repenting and asking for forgiveness when they commit a certain act of sin. But they are finding it so difficult to overcome. And scenarios like that, uh, you know, we encourage them to receive help, speak to their leaders, their friends, and see how they can journey together, disciple them together out of it. And I believe it's possible. And then there are those individuals who are ignorant and arrogant, saying, thinking that, okay, uh, you know, I can just take this for granted, the price that Jesus paid, uh, you know, um, next Sunday is uh, communion, I'll just ask and forgive. And if it does not do anything uh, to you in your heart, it does not cause you to live a different life, um, then uh, those are just vain, vain words uh, in my point of view, Ravli. Uh, thank you for that, Roshan. Um, yeah, makes sense in many, many ways. You're most welcome. Uh, you know, I was genuinely that person who was struggling in uh, uh, with with a certain um, habit uh, habits that I had in terms of alcohol and whatnot as a teenager. Though I gave my life to Jesus at the age of seventeen, I was born in a Christian family. In a you know, um, and so I Sunday school and all that was there. But seventeen, I gave my life to Him. I was baptized and water in 2001 january 11th all of that happened but i was still uh you know had my own challenges as a teenager in my adolescent years and whatnot but uh you know and i think i, I would like to think that i was one of those individuals who really longed to come out of it uh, but e eventually uh, here i am uh, and so um praise god for that but, so I believe that there are individuals who are willing, but they're unable to, just like the scripture says. And then there are those who are not willing at all. And so we can't uh, help them much. And Saul was one of those cases who was just not willing. He wanted to pretend. Uh, and that's why he was a man of the position, while David was a man of the presence. Okay. Um, so if any individual, any minister of God is um, uh, is after a position, than the presence they are treading on dangerous waters. Okay. I, I hope that, I, that made sense, but yeah, thank you. Okay, um, so just continuing on, and where we pause, is uh, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, uh, again, it says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness now the greek word used there for commits is living in sin habitual sin um right and the this this epistle of uh, first john is wonderful because he talks about sin the forg the power of uh, forgiveness the power of repentance and shows how jesus is uh, faithful to forgive he continues talking about that and by the, chapter 5 you see he's talking about a believer who's living in habitual sin uh, it's just, just a wonderful epistle this uh, one john um all his epistles but yeah so what the word commits there is referring to is living in uh in habitual sin um so uh, they're constantly uh you know whatever any example, negative example that you want to think, that you can think of, you can think of, but that's the lifestyle that they are living in. Um, and they are not encouraged to do that, um, to come out of it, to, uh, to seek repentance, to ask for forgiveness, and they will be forgiven. Um, and so, we, and, and we'll continue to see some more examples of uh, believers uh, in a believer's life and repentance. For example, in Simon, the former sorcerer, uh, in Acts chapter 8, we read that this person called Simon, who was a sorcerer, he hears Philip preach. 
and then he goes to him and uh, you know uh, he gives his life he hears the gospel and he says and he even gets baptized in the water and then much later we see that uh, you know when he uh, when he sees Peter, he says he offers him money uh, to gain what Peter is carrying. It's like, hey, I'll give you so much. What can I give to have what you have? And Peter rebukes him, saying, you need to think differently. Uh, you know, because he Peter uh, tells Simon to repent because of the thought of his heart. And so, although he was baptized, um, you know, he's a new believer, uh, he was uh, rebuked and uh, asked to repent from the way he, he because of the way he thought. Um, and in this famous episode in uh, Corinthian church, in First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 to 13, Paul writes and says, uh, Be careful of a person who is living in a habitual sin, who is constantly living in sin. Um, it says not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater. Uh, it, it's just saying that who's constantly living in all this, uh, living in all this immorality. Is not to say that you hate the person. Uh, is you you love the person, but you cannot condone. Uh, you know what the person is doing, uh, or uh, be an evangelist, or promote uh, and agree with their lifestyle. It says, uh, you know. You let them know, um, you know, this is what your stance is on and how they are living their lives. Um, okay, um, so that's First Corinthians chapter five, verse eleven to thirteen, um, and then goes on to say, what about leaders in the church? Um, you know, one First Timothy chapter five, verse nineteen to twenty-two. This, how do we correct church leaders who are living in continual sin if it comes to light? though uh, because so many times it remains a secret in the dark right um, and and uh, but eventually when it does come to light how do we correct that because we remember we're talking about repentance and recovery right the, the heart here is uh, you know we don't uh, kind of crucify the person who is uh, you know, living in sin, we give, we let them know th there is uh, there's an opportunity for them to re repent, and then they also have the opportunity to be you know to be restored. Um, so how do we do that? That's the heart behind this topic, right? Um, so how do we correct the church leaders who are co constantly living in continual sin? Uh, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, 19, uh, he says, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Um, so, you know, don't just take a person's, uh, uh, you know, word for, for the, uh, you know, um, anything that's been done, um, ha any harm that's been done, but ha is there, are there more witnesses? Uh, is there more to this accusation? And then correct. And it goes on, he goes on to say in verse 20, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. And uh, in verse 21, he says, do this without prejudice, uh, doing nothing with partiality. That means uh, don't give any preference to anybody, be it a church leader or a, a, a member of the congregation. Uh, correct them. And don't give any preference. Right? Do it without prejudice. Do it without any partiality. Okay. Um, and then, how do we? Uh, you know, once a person has repented, how do we help them uh, to this uh, in this journey of restoration? As we see in Galatians six, verse one and two, it says, "Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, in any sin." Um, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Right? It says, okay, if there's a person who is, you know is struggling in sin, who has been overtaken, is, is a, it's just a language that's saying, okay, who's overcome by sin, who's living, who's overwhelmed, who's living in continual sin, uh, you who are spiritual, restore, offer, Right, such one in a spirit of gentleness, okay, not not with an attitude of condemnation, uh, saying you go to them and say okay, you're condemned and this is your fate, 
uh, blah, 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 etc. Right? But in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, knowing, uh, realizing that, okay, you know, what is, what's happening to them can also happen to me, um, because I'm still living in flesh. Right? And so by doing so, in verse 2, it says, bear one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so by doing this, we fulfill God's command. In Matthew 22, uh, I think he says, when Pharisees ask Jesus, uh, Master, what's the greatest commandment? He says, the first one is, I love the Lord your God with all, all your soul, heart, mind, and strength. And then, I love your neighbor as yourself. And all of the commandments of the prophets hangs on these two. Um, it's about loving one another. And uh, when, we, uh, when we move in love, in gentleness, in patience, and in kindness, Towards each other, and when we recognize a person, a friend of yours, um, a member of the con congregation that you know is struggling, um, you offer and you walk with them and disciple them and saying, "How can I be of any help?" Uh, right? And so, the restoring a fallen believer is um, is you are demonstrating the love of Jesus to them. And then once again, and uh, we saw that God's message was also to the seven churches. So it's not just to unbelievers, but it's also to the believers. And uh, and what we discussed in the last session um, about the New Testament concluding with the message of repentance to the five out of the seven churches is kind of elaborated uh, in this uh, in this uh, ending session of this chapter uh, to the church in Ephesus. They they had to repent because they had forgotten their first love. And their first works and what is interesting is uh you know sure we're not studying about uh uh you know end times but all of these uh the letters to the seven churches it starts off by saying that i i, I see you i see what you're doing that means god's eyes uh, are on us he's constantly watching what we're doing and he says i see you i see you i see you I have seen, I have seen, right? When you go through those letters. And so to the church in Ephesus, he was saying that repent because you've forgotten your first love. And to the church in Pergamos, he says, false because of false doctrine leading to immorality, repent. And same thing with the church in Thyatira, is false doctrine leading to immor uh, immorality, imperfect works, and self-deception to the church in Laodicea. Right? So Yes, in, as a conclusion, that believers need to repent, right? Uh, and um, I thought we'd end with this today, but uh, I think as a concluding, we can just look at chapter five as um, as just a conclusion for today's session, right? And so, having spoken about all these, uh, the importance of repentance, and uh, having spoken about uh, living a life of sin, uh, have been habitual sin. Um, so, are there any partiality uh, among sins? Are the acts of sin? Uh, does God view it a certain way? Right? Are, are all sins great, uh, or uh, is there some hierarchy? <laughs> Uh, you know, does does he differentiate between sins, or all these equally detestable in God's eyes? Right? For example, a lust or adultery. Now we can read about it in Matthew chapter five, verse twenty-one and twenty-eight. In the Old Testament, the act mattered. The act of adultery mattered. Um, it, it was condemned. Um, but in the New Testament, we know that Jesus says, if you look at a woman with lust, you have committed adultery. Uh, he holds the standard really high, right? And in John one, in one John uh, three fifteen, he says, uh, again in the Old Testament, an act of murder was condemned, but in one John three fifteen says that if you hate your brother, it's murder. Just a thought. And uh, Proverbs chapter six verse sixteen to nineteen, uh, you know, you can look at. There are seven things that the Lord detests. Uh, six that are uh, um, that he he just doesn't tolerate that, and the first thing on the list is pride, haughty eyes, right? Um, so you say, okay, Lord, I, I I have not looked at anyone with uh, with lust, I I don't hate anyone, but 
uh, you have this pride uh, about yourself uh, or, or a condescending attitude uh, towards the others uh, or if you harbor bitterness uh, and all of that we see in Revelation 21 verse 8 uh, all of them it leads to the same place they all receive the same judgment all of it doesn't matter the thought or the act um, they all lead to the same place and so we must treat all sin with equal disdain because all of it is hated by God right and so um, we will continue on this topic in the next uh, next week um, on uh, I thought we, we, we too much of content uh, has been absorbed today and um, so yeah, just continue to think about uh, everything that we've learned today, pray about it, and uh, we'll continue next week. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in. And uh, continue to pray for the BC team, BC students who've gone to Mangalore on mission trip. I uh, pray that they would have a fruitful time of ministry in Mangalore as they serve. All right. Thank you so much for joining. God bless you. Uh, have a good remaining day.